Much has been written about the racial component of anti-Japanese propaganda during the Second World War. While both the Nazi Germans and the fascist Italians were at times stereotyped along national lines, the racist imagery of the Japanese enemy went far beyond this. More than 500 comic books published during the war years feature Japanese characters on the cover, far more than any other specific group. The United States did not go to war with Japan over racial issues, but once war was declared, the ethnic differences between the two nations were utilized for propaganda purposes. Although the road to open armed conflict between the United States and Japan was long and involved, the trigger was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. This galvanized American public opinion and led to an immediate switch from pre-war popular culture focusing mostly on the Nazis as potential enemies to predominantly anti-Japanese imagery. Much of the virulence of propaganda in 1942 and 1943 was the result of what Americans perceived as Japan's treacherous strike on Hawaii, the Philippines, and British possessions in the Far East. Previous episodes of this series have addressed the Japanese as members of the Axis powers and covered depictions of wartime atrocities attributed to the Japanese and the Nazis. This episode shall examine several additional facets of propaganda with particular emphasis on comic book covers. I'll send you Tojo's whiskers, honey, tied around his ears. Oh, Tojo's ears, as souvenirs. He'll send us Tojo's whiskers, honey, tied around his ears. Unlike Nazi Germany's Adolf Hitler or fascist Italy's Benito Mussolini, Japan did not have a primary face in Allied propaganda. Emperor Hirohito was Japan's titular leader, but he was hardly a public figure even in his own land. Hideki Tojo was prime minister during the war years and was a major proponent of Japan's war policy but did not achieve the same sort of international notoriety as Hitler or Mussolini. It is often difficult to discern whether specific images of Japanese characters in wartime popular culture are intended to represent Hirohito or Tojo, or in fact, a generic Japanese military figure. Both men wore eyeglasses, had mustaches, and the most familiar photographs of both men show them in military uniform. Tojo had little hair, but since many Japanese caricatures were pictured with shaved heads and many others wore military headgear, this trait is not very helpful in identification. Generally, when pictured in the company of Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, it may be assumed that the Japanese figure is intended to represent the emperor particularly if he is clad in a bemetalled uniform and is carrying a sword. Still, many comic book covers feature Japanese characters who resemble neither Hirohito nor Tojo, and the majority of anti-Japanese comic book covers are not intended to depict either man. Covers which most clearly represent Emperor Hirohito include American Air Forces number no. two, Batman Comics number no. eighteen, Big Shot number no. twenty eight, Catman number no. nineteen, The Fighting Yank number no. twelve, Master Comics number no. twenty nine, Sensation Comics number no. thirteen. Terry Tunes number seven, and America's Best number eleven. There are also occasional references to the Emperor as the Mikado, as well as images of or references to Tojo on a number of wartime comic book covers. Some comic covers also indirectly reference Japan's Emperor 
by depicting imperial installations under attack. I want to drop a bomb and set the Japanese city on fire. Not because they are so rotten, I just love to see them die. Because comic book covers are a mostly visual medium, explicit expressions of rage against Japan for its attack on Pearl Harbor were difficult to portray. Comic book stories, films, radio programs, posters, and other forms of propaganda had the advantage of time, space, and text and or dialogue to convey a more specific message. However, American feeling about Japan's lack of military ethics may be seen on wartime comic book covers in two ways. First, in the depiction of atrocities and other violations of the code of civilized warfare. This topic is covered in more detail in Deconstructing Propaganda, Episode 5. The second manner in which comic book covers show hostility to the militaristic regime in Japan is by the frequent depiction of brutal, even gory death or injury meted out to Japanese soldiers. This type of imagery is almost never utilized on any cover dealing with the Nazis and seems to have been a deliberate way to express rage at Japanese atrocities, from the attack on Pearl Harbor to the Bataan Death March and the execution of American flyers captured after the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo. One of the most egregious examples of graphic gore appears on the cover of Fight Comics number 31, dated April 1944. Joe Doolin's art shows a Japanese soldier having his head completely severed by a machete-wielding GI, as blood gushes from the stump of his neck. This level of violence was extremely rare for a wartime comic book cover and would have even been shocking had it appeared in the horror comics era of the early 1950s. Another severed, blood-dripping Japanese head can be seen on the cover of the Shadow Comics from May 1944. The context is not clear, but the caption refers to the Brain of Nippon, and the terrified and agonized faces of the Japanese figure at the bottom of Charles Cole's artwork suggest something sinister is going on. Relatively few comic books in the wartime era showed blood at all, but many artists and editors made an exception when it came to the Japanese foe. It's tap for the Japs since they bombed Pearl Harbor. It's tap for the Japs since they pulled that boner. That Sunday morning on the Isle of Oahu will never be forgotten and they'll soon be through. Although no blood is in evidence, the cover of Red Dragon Comics number 7 from July 1943 graphically shows the titular superhero painfully disintegrating the body of a Japanese officer. Wartime comic book covers found various ways to eliminate Japanese characters. USA Comics No. 13, Summer 1944, shows Captain America squashing enemy troops with a bulldozer. The Black Terror and his sidekick Tim drive a steamroller over Japanese soldiers on the cover of Exciting Comics No. 35, October 1944. Fire was another method of vanquishing the enemy. As well as bayonets. Hawkman even uses a medieval mace on the enemy on the cover of All-Star Comics No. 11 from June-July 1942. Most wartime comic book covers were less gruesome. A large number showed superheroes and American soldiers who were content to merely punch or kick their Japanese adversaries.
we didn't want to do it, but they're asking for it now. So we'll slap the Japs right into the laps of the Nazis. When they hop on Honolulu, that's a thing we won't allow. So we'll slap the Japs right into the laps of the Nazis. gonna have to slap the dirty little Jap, and Uncle Sam's the guy who can do it. We'll skin that streak of yellow from the sneaky little fella, and he'll think a cyclone struck him when we're through it. We'll take that double crosser to the old woodshed, we'll start right on his bottom and we'll go to his head. When we get done with him, he'll wish that he was dead, we've gotta slap a dirty little Jap. Johnny was a soldier boy who never looked for scraps, but this young buckaroo was Yankee through and through. Then Johnny heard our country's call to arms against the Japs, and as he marched away, his buddies heard him say, Goodbye, Mama, I'm off to Yokohama for my red, white, and blue, my country and you. A considerable number of wartime comic book covers feature large-scale scenes of superheroes and or American troops in combat against Japanese soldiers. For the most part, these are not realistic depictions of battlefield action, but they do reflect the reality of the two-front war. American ground troops were not active against the Germans and Italians until late 1942 with the landings in North Africa. The invasion of Italy proper did not occur until late summer 1943, followed by the invasion of Normandy beginning on D-Day the 6th of June 1944. In contrast, Allied soldiers clashed with Japanese invaders in the Philippines, Guam, Wake Island and elsewhere beginning in December 1941, and even went on the offensive at Guadalcanal in the fall of 1942. Consequently, the attention of the American public was focused more on the Pacific War in the early part of the conflict, and comic book covers reflect this.
America's entrance in the war, air combat on comic book covers was focused almost entirely on the activities of the RAF against the Luftwaffe. However, as discussed in the previous section, in the period immediately after Pearl Harbor, American forces were primarily engaged in combat with the Japanese. The Pacific Theater had major elements of ground, naval, and air warfare, and comic book covers are rife with images of the ubiquitous Japanese Zero aircraft challenged by superheroes, allied aircraft, and even gremlins. A flight of silver in the sky, a group of wings are flying high at the air core of Uncle Sam. To guard the flag of liberty, to live or die, that we be free at the air core of Uncle Sam. One, two, three, four, ready formation, on they fly, a revelation in wings. I like the eagle in its flight, to show the world our fighting might we see. Although it may seem slightly counterintuitive, given that many Japanese on the west coast of the United States were interned for the duration and were thus not at liberty to commit subversive activities, even if they had been so inclined, a fair number of wartime comic book covers depict the activities of Japanese spies and saboteurs in America. The covers of Green Hornet comics were particularly involved in such depictions, showing Japanese characters threatening an aluminum mine, a war bonds parade, an aircraft plant, a tank factory, an airfield, and a railroad bridge. The cover of Green Hornet comics number 19 even shows Japanese saboteurs apparently escapees from the real-life Tool Lake internment camp preparing to blow up a train. Other wartime comic covers illustrate Japanese threats against American installations such as a federal arsenal, the Panama Canal, Boulder Dam, and a city reservoir, among others. As discussed in a previous episode of Deconstructing Propaganda, one frequent ploy of wartime popular culture was to portray the enemy as inhuman, either as unsympathetic animals or literal monsters. Comic books use this method, although rather sparingly. Air Fighters Comics No. 6 is one of the most blatant animal allegory comic covers as Japanese rats are strafed by Airboy in his bird plane. The Japanese rat linkage also appeared in other media. Another animal motif used in both Allied and Axis propaganda was the octopus, whose tentacles signify the enemy's grasping ambition to conquer the world. Funny Animal comic Haha ha Number 20 makes the familiar Japanese ape connection, 
as does the cover of Super Magician Comics Volume 2, Number 3. Japanese monsters appear on the covers of a number of wartime comic books, including Kid Comics Number 2, Marvel Mystery Number 50, and Pep Number 39, each of which depict giant Japanese monster warriors. Captain America number 14 shows some grotesque Japanese villains preparing to torture Captain America's sidekick Bucky. A recurring character in wartime propaganda was the Tokyo Kid, created for Douglas Aircraft Company motivational posters by former Disney artist Jack Campbell. More than just a stereotypical Japanese caricature, the Tokyo Kid was drawn as a literal monster with fangs. A version of the Tokyo Kid appears on the cover of Air Ace Comics No. 2, about to be lynched by an allied airman. You're a zap, Mr. Jap. You don't know Uncle Sammy when he fights for his rights. You take it on the lammy for he'll wipe the axis right off the map. You're a zap, 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 Mr. Jap. Although propaganda treated the Japanese enemy with more anger than the Nazis or Italians, wartime comic book covers also mocked the Japanese in a humorous fashion at times. The 1942 bombing of Tokyo by planes under the direction of Colonel James Doolittle was one of the early successes in the war on Japan, although the actual damaged cause was relatively light. As the war went on, aerial bombing of the Japanese home islands became more frequent and deadly, and comic book covers often depicted this activity. Time comic books showed attacks on Japanese territory by superheroes and others. Even though in real life there was no actual ground invasion of Japan itself. Pay them more than double for the trouble they've begun. Oh, the sun will soon be setting for the land of the rising sun. As with propaganda posters, some wartime comic book covers featured symbolic or allegorical imagery. Some of the most obvious uses of symbolism involve the rising sun motif as well as the Japanese flag. Artwork of globes, maps of Japan, and signs referring to Tokyo helped convey the idea that Japan was now a target of the Allied war effort marked for destruction and defeat. 
Home front contributions towards victory, such as the purchase of war bonds, were also depicted. Some wartime comic book covers were more esoteric. On the cover of Adventure Comics number 96, a Japanese officer dreams that his plans to invade the USA are being thwarted by superheroes Sandman and Sandy. The cover of Air Ace Volume 3 number 1 is split between an educational image of children working on a science project and a depiction of Japanese soldiers apparently being blasted by the multiple hands of an all-seeing god. Several comic book covers show the Japanese symbolically dwarfed by superheroes. And the cover of Captain Marvel number 16 shows readers that Captain Marvel and Uncle Sam have teamed up to beat the Jap invaders in Alaska. It's Pat for the Jap since they bombed Pearl Harbor. It's Pat for the Jap since they pulled that boner. That Sunday morning on the Isle of Oahu will never be forgotten and they'll soon be through. The racially charged images of the Japanese foe in wartime propaganda are shocking today. Given the inherent contradictions in this attitude, the racially similar Chinese were praised as our allies, for example, while Germans and Italians were rarely attacked as nationalities. The explanation seems to be that Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor produced such outrage on the part of the American public that Japan became a target for the most egregious propaganda assault, far surpassing the vitriol tossed at the Nazis or Italian fascists, and the racist component was added as a means of further insulting and attacking the enemy. This doesn't excuse the racial aspects of anti-Japanese propaganda, but it does go a long way towards explaining why the tone was significantly more mean-spirited than pop culture attacks aimed at the other Axis partners. <laughs>